Good afternoon and welcome to the 163rd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we have a post-election day discussion with Andy Revkin. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. I want to give a shout out to Shivani Patel and Bucky Stanton, who both continue to help me with COVID calls. Incredible amount of work they've been doing in these last few weeks. Bucky focuses on the production side of things, getting these podcasts up in a timely manner usually much faster than I can even get him the material. And Shivani has been working really hard on helping to recruit and get guests for the program. And we've got some interesting things coming in the future, including uh, rolling out a series of COVID calls where we'll be interviewing members of Congress about COVID-19. So stay tuned for that. And thanks to Bucky and to Shivani. As of today, November 4th, 2020, there are 1,217,745 deaths from COVID-19 globally according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 9,405,705 cases of COVID-19 in the United States. That's up from 9,358,469 cases reported yesterday. And there are now a total of 233,265 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States. That's up from 232,374 reported yesterday. We are continuing to break records for numbers of infections and staying at around that thousand death a day mark. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way. And I'd like to continue that now. Yesterday I focused half an hour of COVID calls on reading obituaries of healthcare workers. I'd like to read you a story that appeared in today's Detroit Free Press. Headline, What It's Like to Vote When You Have COVID-19 by Omari Sankofa II. Like many Americans, Demetrius Alexander had the November 3rd election circled on his calendar. A positive COVID-19 test nearly ruined his plans to vote. Alexander, a 41-year-old Detroit resident, tested positive for the virus last Thursday. He isn't sure how he got it, but Tuesday morning he felt well enough to vote. In its election health and safety guidelines, the Michigan Secretary of State encouraged clerks to accommodate curbside voting or separate voting booths for people who have symptoms. When Alexander arrived at his polling place at Henry Ford High School, he immediately let poll workers know he had tested positive. A poll worker told Alexander his COVID-19 diagnosis put elderly staff members within the precinct at risk of getting sick. Rather than allowing him to vote curbside, Alexander was told to vote at Wayne County Community College, which was not his assigned polling location. The poll workers were under the impression that at Wayne County Community College, Alexander would be able to take advantage of drive through voting. After a two and a half hour wait, Alexander said that was not the case. Once Alexander arrived, he was told to wait in his car. Eventually, poll workers told him that he couldn't vote outside of his assigned precinct and that he needed to get in touch with the city clerk's office. After hitting another dead end, Alexander worried that he might have run out of time to vote. I got kids and I try to teach them the moral value of voting, showing their democracy and what America is built on, Alexander said. But even with all the unrest that's going on in America right now and all the tension and everything else, you know how valuable this election is to everyone, no matter what your opinion is, no matter what. After being turned away late Tuesday afternoon, Alexander thought it might be too late. I can't vote because I have something that was not even up to me. It wasn't my choice. Alexander, who said he missed voting in only one election, called hotlines for voters, news organizations, and voting advocacy organizations, which told him to go back to his polling place. Tuesday evening, Alexander returned to Henry Ford High School. By then, workers there were prepared to help him vote curbside, a poll worker said. When he came back here, 
the people from our organization gave me his direct contact and I was able to intercept him outside here right at the door, communicate to him that I would be working with him to make sure we were able to get his ballot. Rashawn Harris, an organizer for Detroit Action and poll worker at Henry Ford High School said, I went back in there, talked to the election officials, worked out a plan on how we could do it in the safest way possible, and then brought the ballot out to the young man and was able to vote. Alexander's ordeal offers a window into the realities of voting during a, pandem <clears throat> in, during a pandemic. COVID-19 cases have spiked during an election season that's expected to draw record voter turnout in Michigan. In the end, Alexander voted, but as Michigan experiences another surge of the virus, he wondered how many people weren't able to put in the hours to ensure they could vote. The process, he said, was discouraging, the point where I almost gave up. Pretty extraordinary story there. And you may have just seen in the New York Times that they have called Michigan for Joe Biden. Okay, I want to turn to my discussion today. And to do that, let me introduce Andy Revkin. Hey. Let me give a, a little bit of background for people who don't know Andy. He was previously strategic advisor for environmental and science journalism at National Geographic Society through 2017. He was senior reporter for climate change at the independent investigative newsroom ProPublica. He was a reporter for the New York Times from 1995 through 2009. In 2007, he created the Dot Earth environmental blog for the Times, which anybody who follows environment or climate knows that and probably first learned about climate change through that. The blog moved to the opinion pages in 2010 and ran through 2016. He is also a songwriter and was a frequent accompanist of Pete Seeger. He's now director of the new initiative on communication and sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. And he has a podcast that he runs almost every day, I believe, um, called Sustain What? And we're going to talk about that and many, many other things about what this election has to do with public health and science. Andy Revkin, thanks a lot for coming back on COVID Calls. It's a pleasure to be with you, Scott. I really, uh, anytime I think I'm working hard, I look around me and I find people working twice as hard. And so the fact that you do this every, every weekday is astounding. Um, yeah, my thing evolved into a four, t four times a week venture if you include sundays so it's um it's all an adventure on the sundays you're doing music still right yeah i i think you know we underappreciate the role of the arts generally um and i've had artist tours you know where an artist will take us around his studio or her studio and using a phone or something we've done we had a play performed uh four different art really? actors four different actors in four different apartments uh, performing a play that was a climate <laughs> it's called other than we It's an amazing play very dark and hopeful in a very weird way at the very end of human experience in an overheating planet in a dome living and uh people figuring out new things and um it worked pretty well you know it was just voice it was just a reading really but it was fantastic mm -hmm. so so the sunday shows and a lot of music um some great people have been on been fun keeps me going and the people that you have on for those shows are they finding that they can create during this time are you writing music in this time i actually haven't written a new song and i'm embarrassed to say at least a decade so um my, i have one album that came out in 2013 yeah i've been performing for decades but um and i have a band and we, we were performing regularly in the hudson valley where i live in uh, that's that got shut down. So, uh, but yeah, no, a lot of the people coming on are really actively writing some amazing songs about this moment. Uh, Dean Friedman uh, did the song. I wish, but uh, I wish uh, I, I wish we could get back to a halfway normal world. <laughs> and it's about right. the ball game and going to the movie with friends. And but done in a really beautiful way. And um, others use the writing uh, as a practice. Um, Claudia Gibson down in Texas is part of a songwriting group. And every week they challenge themselves to write a new song. They uh, use a prompt, which I think is a great exercise for anyone to try to write something. Just someone throws out some random words and they have to kind of build a song. 
And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of creativity underway right now. And it's, you know, trauma and distress, unfortunately, also can breed um, arts too. Absolutely. One of the most uh, interesting COVID calls I did was with a taiko drum performer, a master named Marco Leonhardt. And uh, he performed, but which was astounding. But he also shared kind of the history of taiko and the importance of the songs, particularly coming out of Japan and particularly as a way over time, long periods of time to cope with disaster, to cope with stress, but also to tell the story over time. Right. And, you know, we're just swimming in statistics every day, which are impossible for me to take in. I mean, I read them, but I, I can't really process them, I don't think. And then a song or turn of phrase, poetry, some couple of lines have a way of speaking right now. Yeah, Jimmy Keeligan was on our show from Canada who wrote this, what I consider one of the great disaster ballads about the Man Gulch Fire in 1949 in Montana. Mm -hmm. Canadian songwriter, but he did the song. Uh, and it's all about the story, personalizing it, putting you in the shoes of those uh, smoke jumpers who just basically jumped into hell and didn't come back. And he performed it beautifully. And we had a whole conversation around fire history. Stephen Pine, a great writer, historian of fire. I put him together in the same show. So I had the musician, oh. the uh, Arizona State you know, historian. I, that's what's been fun about these shows. You know, fun is a weird word, but no, I know what you stimulating mean. Um, yeah. is to put together a historian, a journalist, a songwriter, poet, um, and just have them kind of mash together and really cool things happen. I had Pine on and he was so, I mean, we talked for an hour. He's amazing. He is amazing. And the depth of knowledge, but also just the real, I mean, a lot of forward thinking ideas. You know, one expects with somebody who studies policy over a long period of time and continually sees mistakes being made, like in the wildland fire space, you would think they would get jaded, but it just seems to motivate him to more writing and more thinking and more engagement. Some people just are, have that determination to keep on swimming, just like that, uh, which of the uh, animated movies were the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> is that Finding Nemo? Yeah, Finding Nemo, keep on swimming, you know? So is that you right now with climate? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm yes, <laughs> look, as you know, I probably showed you this before. This is my 1988 relic. My, so that's a long time ago, right? <laughs> Cover story yeah. on global warming. It's so long, it's so old that there's cigarette ads on the back and climate concern on the front. And, you know, it's literally like almost like a museum piece. Uh, so I'm almost like a museum piece. That, that was literally half a life ago. You know, 30, I wrote that when I was just gotten in my 30s. I'm 64 now. So. And for whatever reason, um, I don't think it's because I'm a glutton for punishment. It's because, uh, you know, as a disaster historian, my, my guess is you probably have some of this into you, in, in you as too. It's like there's a, a deep curiosity and um, puzzlement to the challenge uh, that seems one of humanity's most profound challenges. How can we deal differently with these risks that are illuminated by science that that the behavioral and social sciences show we suck at. <laughs> we just had a show earlier today that you're on my webcast where David Ropeek, who wrote, literally wrote the book, <laughs> How Risky Is It Really? Uh, decades ago, you know, we we're talking about the same question. Um, are we stuck with what, what I call blah, 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 bang uh, right. mode? Right. And I would like to think there's some pathway here that can get past that, you know, and I see examples just, you know, sort of like fleeting signs of hope sometimes, but um, overall I see lots of reasons to think we're really bad at that still. Maybe let's talk about it a little bit in the context of, uh, you were on one of my first COVID calls, you were on uh, March 24th. There were 600 deaths in the United States at that time. So we were talking about approaching a 9-11 level event yeah. in those days. Um, and <clears throat> maybe you could reflect a little bit on that between then and now, because a lot's happened since then. George Floyd's murder, yeah. 
the entire campaign, the pandemic becoming what it has become. Where have the discussion, the other discussions that you maybe thought you'd be tracking this year, particularly around disaster politics, around climate change, where have those been in this mix, if at all? Well, as you said, and as I've been exploring recently, when you have essentially a four-dimensional chess game underway, where the rules are evolving a little bit each time, where each player is playing with a different rule book to a certain extent, where you have this political landscape that's so utterly complicated because, you know, things like climate science, the basics are really clear. Things like climate science in the context of human reaction and, and politics and even getting people focused on the scale of the problem, the time scale issues, it's hard to imagine even in a year without an election, pathways to uh, something new. The election also the process, even among, let's say progressives, Democrats, you know, you have this series, there's layers there of, of belief about what's the strategy that works. And this goes, takes me back to 2008, 2009, ahead of the climate bill that was being hashed out, the idea of having a, you know, climate legislation and, you know, I saw these fights to the death between camps. Um, right. You can take it back to 2003, McCain-Lieberman, the first climate legislation. And mm -hmm. environmental groups bailed out on Lieberman, on, Mc, on uh, that because McCain, for various reasons, wanted it to introduce uh, provisions uh, with, uh, involving nuclear power. Right. And at that time, climate community didn't, was not the, the uh, mainstream environmental groups were still, you know, their demographics were such that um, nuclear is just a non-starter. And if anything, that's gotten worse now. So um, that that can lead you to just complete par paralysis or um, it can lead, it, what it's led me to, especially with climate. Sorry about the, uh, I forgot to close my door. Um, yeah. Is the best strategy, not just to stay sane, but to actually be effective is to break this thing called the climate crisis into its component parts. And that, you know, again, none of this has any meaning in an election year because everyone's just focused on the election. But essentially, on the disaster side, the risk side, there's tons you can do at the local, regional, state, national level to reduce risk from climate hazards. There's one thing you can do on energy, which is to reduce emissions or to take them out of the atmosphere once they're right. ready. And that time scale, if in a very dispassionate way, if you look at the science, you say, okay, using the age old tool of, of your community, the risk formulation, risk equals hazard times exposure. How many people are exposed to the thing? And the thing is the risk, whether it's a volcanic eruption or an earthquake or a or a hurricane, and then what's their capacity or incapacity to withstand that risk, you know, vulnerability. Right. And when you do that, you get all these action points. There's tons to do. It wouldn't wrap into a single bill very easily because some of it's about emergency preparedness. Some of it's about uh, zoning, uh, building codes in fire mm -hmm. zones, mm -hmm. uh, looking at insurance, uh, flood insurance in new ways. And some of it, the carbon part is completely detached from that because even if, um, you know, all my best friends in the climate movement and I and you and, and um, you know, Greta, Al Gore, if we all ran the world tomorrow, reducing emissions at, at an unbelievable pace, like Paris pace, that doesn't change the risk. It does not change the risk. It doesn't modulate your exposure to or vulnerability to hurricanes or flood or sea level rise on, on a basis that for decades. So like that immediately says to me that th theoretically in a functional political system, which we don't have, you should be able to have some really co cogent, constructive conversations about how to reduce risk and what to do about the future of energy mm -hmm. with libertarians and liberals. Li libertarians don't like flood insurance. They don't like the federal government 
to be bailing out repeatedly some right. wanton homeowner building rebuilding the homes you know 30 or 40 times and in, in uh what's the term for that the uh hyper it's not hyperbolic <laughs> loss <laughs> Uh, extreme okay. repetitive yeah repetitive, repetitive loss, loss. right yeah yeah uh, i i have plenty of friends who are you know anti-regulation right. anti uh you know big government who who want to work on that you know so, so that in theory there's a real big menu of things to do uh this year and now you know if we end up with a divided congress again how that happens you know uh, Biden has sworn he will wants to govern America, not just you know, factionalize. Um, but the, the other side has to want to play, and I don't know how that's. We'll have to see. Yeah, let, just thinking again about this this stretch of time that, um, and I think we touched on this when we talked back in March. The at that time everybody was mm -hmm. indoors. <clears throat> they were the schools were shut down. We had yet to have the mask wars. Yeah. It was a pretty profound moment of global collective action. Yeah. And there was a, there were a whole raft of stories that came out in March and April and May that also looked at the kind of um and they were these stories were a little squeamish about framing it this way I think but they're like no nobody would choose a pandemic to to do this but we are living through an experiment in <laughs> carbon reduction. Right. Let's learn from it. Right. And there was some juice around that discussion, I felt like, and I, I maybe it just got swamped into everything that's happened. You know, the Black Lives Matter, of course, needed to be on the front page more than that discussion. For um, sure. But I, I don't want to lose those points because the, the bleakness of the cop meetings and the sort of fatalism particularly with Brazil and the United States and Australia's behavior in regards to, you know, any kind of global collective action, it seemed like the way that people were able to mobilize early with this pandemic speaks, speaks back to that a little bit. And I'm ready for my correction now. <laughs> well, I, I'm a realist ultimately. I've been punished for that off and on a long time, especially when I was blogging at the New York Times. <clears throat> you know, being at the New York Times because it makes you a target for everybody. Uh, progressives, conservatives. Um, and, but I was really impressed way back in, um, I think it was also in March, my colleague Dale Willman did his, I think it was his first, um, his first or second webinar for journalists. Uh, he's starting a program on resilience in journalism at Columbia and my program. And he had on Nate Hagens, who's at the, he's the founder and he run, at the uh, Post Carbon Institute. Mm -hmm. On Twitter, it's at post carbon. So, you know, this is all about the transition. His whole shtick is about a post carbon world and how to do it. And Nate was on the show. And at that time, Nate said, I've got it right here in front of me. Uh, there are two timelines here. Right now, we're in a national emergency. Right now, we have to do two things. Uh, Republicans don't want to bail out people, meaning we have to rescue people's lives mm -hmm. you know, with a stimulus. We have to bail out people. Democrats don't want to bail out corporations. We have to bail out corporations. We have to bail out people and corporations. It's like, so he was saying, you know, realistically, we got to get the economy going first and then we can worry about carbon. Mm -hmm. And he's a post carbon guy. <laughs> right. So it, it's right. like, and you, uh, this gets to this, even the issue of, you know, I have a, if I was in Biden's ear, I would have said not build back better. I would have said build forward better. Mm hmm. <laughs> the notion of backward, anything looking back, trying to rebuild the systems and norms we had, the structural norms, is, is, isn't is really, that's not taking advantage of the moment. Mm -hmm. It feels comfortable. You know, we all want to go back. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think at one point early on, I was tweeting, I think we need to, to end the prefix re, R-E, renew, rebuild, revive, restore. Mm -hmm. It's all retroactive. It's not mm -hmm. pro- it's not pro-generative, it's a regenerative. And I've had a number of sessions on my webcast with people like Kate, Kate Rayworth, an economist in England who does this, is trying to do sort of a new approach to economics or donut economics. Uh, and I had on Herman Daly, the founder of ecological economics um, in his eighties now and from his you know sequestered retirement home. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but we still were running up against that 
that instinct we all have to go back to what mm -hmm. was. Um, so, you know, the, the turning point, the mobilization, the fact that breakdowns result in, you know, an opportunity to build. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams, the great writer, uh, environmental writer on our show, she said, and she said it again today, uh, earlier today, she said, um, you know, erosion, destruction is a form of creation. You know, like she's, she was looking at the mesas out her window in Utah, which are being eroded, but they're creating sand that's then making a new landscape, you know. She was using that as a metaphor for what uh, what can come of these kinds of periods. Mm -hmm. But still, we kind of we're stuck with our norms and our path dependent um, confirmation. You know, with the status quo bias, <laughs> you know, is, is, yeah. it makes it hard. The, it's interesting that you, you know, as you talk about the problematic of build back better and, and that kind of language, <clears throat> which I'm cranky about, too. Um, you you realize how much of that discourse is also sort of wrapped up in the idea of really just about property, um, about you know we we we've made some investments and now those investments are at risk and we must now adapt to protect those investments and and I know that's been you know seemingly a space within the climate discussion where people said okay let's find consensus on this um, Republicans don't want to have to um you know see their property values go down they may be more vote motivated to talk about climate if you actually talk about the disappearing coastline as a real estate yeah venture <clears throat> but uh, you know and all of that seemed perfectly i guess fine and reasonable to talk about and look for consensus like that before february but i can't help but feel and i i guess i just i want to keep pushing on this a little bit more that we we have seen these are not new things historically, but they're new to us. We have not seen the world go through something like this simultaneously since the Second World War and before that since 1918. Right. I'll be awfully disappointed if we take nothing away from that, except that, you know, isn't it good to get a vaccine and get back to normal, whatever that means? Yeah, well, it's like... Um... It's possible. It, it this is where, you know, we were bemoaning the lack of leadership all this these months, right? Or well, you you could say he led he led us astray by yeah, um, yeah. by propelling yeah, a yeah, total we're going to talk about that in a second about but, how people but, but like Howie Frumpkin, who is a great epidemiologist and public health scientist, who was on here twice, once back in April where he laid out a great architecture for a um, sort of a national recovery uh, core, like, like the civilian conservation core, the mm -hmm. depression. Uh, and he, he said, look, he, he said, the thing people miss about lockdown, the terrible price we pay for lockdown is that's a moment to be investing. You, that, that's a, you have to exploit that moment to build the capacity to do the next part, which if you want to have an open economy, you have to have, mass testing and tracing ability. You have to have the ability to isolate and quarantine and monitor. And those require a lot of people, a lot of work, a lot of stuff that doesn't exist, a lot of training. So that was the moment for leadership. And that would have included Congress to say, let's do a stimulus, not just the stimulus giving people a check, but the stimulus of building the capacity to be resilient, to have to move from what's called, uh, you know, flattening the curve the lockdown to flatten the curve, which is the dance from the hammer to the dance is one of my right. other frequent right. guests, Thomas Poeo puts it. And, but we completely failed. We missed the opportunity window. And now we're stuck with this fluctuating landscape of uh, it's like waves in a tank, you know, that's just going to keep surging and moving around until and unless we have the ability to do those basic things. So uh, I would like to think now that, you know, let's say, let's say Biden does win and let's, let's say the Republicans um, maintain their hold on the Senate. I, the, you know, that's so problematic in some ways. But if someone wants to go down in history as actually getting at this, there's definitely a menu of things to do that anyone with a remote sense of understanding doesn't include lockdown. It's, we're not going back to lockdown. But there's a big pile of shit you have to do to, to, to be effective and not locked down. 
And you can see this in Europe in terms of countries that have failed and succeeded, uh, or not just Europe, other parts of the world too. So yeah. what I would like to think, and I'm not quite sure what question led to this, that the, the big if is leadership in Congress too. Someone mm -hmm. has to be a big boy. I just want to remind everybody that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to Andy Revkin on the day after the election. And that's exactly the turn I wanted to take Andy's actually maybe to get it a little bit into brass tacks sure. now. Um, By the way, I am drinking. This is a beer. <laughs> yeah, it's I always encourage my guests at the beginning <laughs> while I'm reading uh, global death statistics i encourage them to hang out in the green room and and relax so i'm glad you are uh, and i know you've already put in a very full day and probably were up late last night the, the, um, pretzel, the pretzels here are a little stale i gotta tell yeah. you well i'm sorry i didn't get your rider in time i i didn't know exactly <laughs> what to provide um let's talk a little bit about um So yeah, so let's let's start with with what you know, nobody wants to jinx anything, but let's say it's a Biden administration, um, it, with a Republican Congress, but barely Republican Senate and a Democratic House. What kind of things? Let's talk policy. What kind of policies and potentially new structures could come about in the next in the next Congress? Let's say that will because I, I i think we we do some disservice if we think about them separately but I, let's talk about the pandemic we have to confront the pandemic but confronting the pandemic is also about confronting public health in america and it's also not disconnected from confronting environmental justice and disaster justice more generally i, mean, I think they're all interconnected in some ways but with that as a sort of broad mandate and I turn you loose, what kind of advice are you giving to the Biden transition team? I guess I would say the first thing would be um, to look at the vulnerability parts as a separate action plan from the climate part. I'm a big, I'm a fan of the Green New Deal as it was first articulated when I was still at National Geographic wrote about it that was that 2018 february i can't even remember or 2019 was it just 2019 yikes at any rate it had plasticity and there were big there were some really good words in there you know uh, resilience was in there but it's still a package deal in that sense i think a package deal is going to be hard to do in this putative world of a, a you know biden white house and a divided or marginally functional Congress. I do think that this possibility is to have a big resilience push, kind of like what Howard Frumkin outlined. I encourage people to search for Howard Frumkin, F-R-U-M-K-I-N, and uh, national, I can't remember if it's Restore, Restoration or Recovery Act, uh, uh, core. And so it's like jobs. It's resilience. It's um, building a society that's capable of avoiding lockdown. So we don't need to go back to that. Um, it requires training. Uh, it requires investment, and you know that's something that we're going to need. It, it does. Re that all requires uh, acceptance that that public health is a thing <laughs> that that requires work. It requires people. It requires hospitals. It requires um, training. So that. Uh, but I do think it's conceivable. Um, you know, getting that through Congress, we'll have to see. It's also in all 50 states, so the House would be easy, even if the House was Republican, because right. having something that's in every every uh, uh, everyone's basket uh, is good. Uh, climate, you know, clean energy, you look at the uh, maps that um, Yale and George Mason and others have uh, periodically produced of attitudes I wrote about this way back in like 2015. Um, there are no red and blue states when it comes to uh, investment in renewable energy. When it comes even to carbon CO2 regulation as a pollutant, there's no red and blue states. But unfortunately, the congressional structures are still um, such that, you know, as long as there's a super majority limit on filibuster pra practice and stuff, then it's hard to see that going forward. I, I do think you could have a push around uh, energy innovation and renewables as a menu thing and then you have to then you have to 
have the uh, the progressives play nice. Right. Maybe I'm just thinking out loud here. I hadn't thought this mm -hmm. through, but having the Republicans, you know, marginally still in one of the driver's seat would limit the potential of there being an interpretation that there's a mandate now. You know, it would not be nice, you know, a perfect world, you know, we mm -hmm. live in a progressive, the, the, the progressives would take hold and we would have a mandate and you'd be able to create a Green New Deal. Um, it's quite clear that's not the landscape we have, but that doesn't mean you can't do anything. It does require <laughs> some, uh, I don't like the word capitulation, some um, acknowledgement that some of the Biden, some of Biden's most profound qualities, you know, compromise negotiation, uh, need to be in the foreground. What do you think about the kinds of people that Biden might be looking for in um, EPA, in interior? What kinds of, what names are you hearing? What names are you speaking? Um, I, I have not dug in enough to, to be at the name level on who would be, mm -hmm. I think there'll be pressure from the left for it not to be just a retread of Obama names. Mm -hmm. There's there's some strong and uh, arguments against those who were, um, you know, too too enthusiastic about fracking. To, uh, mm -hmm. it's, but yeah, again, the, the the politics now are nuanced. Biden can kind of argue that look, you know, we have to. Um, reflect if we want to if he wants to govern all of america right which is is what he's saying that means he's yeah. going to have to hear all of america which means he's going to have to take in a little bit more of that part of him that in the presidential race was acknowledging that that natural gas remains a big part of the economy uh, and the energy economy uh, then he might have adopted his primary persona which was what got him into hot water in the debate, you know, uh, the primaries forced you to the left and it was more about uh, ending fossil fuels and stopping fracking. It's going to be interesting. It's, and this is where, you know, as a journalist, you know, you have this uh, cop out kind of capacity to be saying, I'm, I'm observing this landscape. It's really interesting. <laughs> you know, this is going to be a cool fight. I, all my Washington journalist friends, I'm sure they're looking at this as, wow, what a great story. You know, Biden trying to, do um, govern in this environment. Mm -hmm. if, again, this is presuming sure. yeah, that one All track. caveats on the table, yeah. for sure. So, so journalism has that issue. To, you know, I'm, I'm sad about that. Um, a lot of our norms tend to play things as, as the equivalent of a sporting event. You know, what's the strategy? Who's up, who's down? As opposed to like, what's the uh, megatons of CO2 mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and the terawatts of uh, terawatt hours of power? It's challenging. Well, Maybe I want to reflect just for a second. So, I mean, that would be on the leadership side, but we've also got uh, people out there who are going to have to get behind these policies. And I just want to, you know, the exit polls from yesterday, uh, there's all kinds of caveats with those too, given the weirdness of the turnout. But one of the things that I think Reuters was writing about this and the Times had a piece about this. Um, the majority, I'm just giving a quote here, the economy was on voters' minds. The majority of Joe Biden voters, around 60%, said the coronavirus pandemic is the most important issue currently facing the U.S. In contrast, Trump voters were more worried about the economy with 50% saying the economy and jobs numbers were the most urgent. Um, and what, you, what it kind of revealed is that, um, you know, it's two sides of, of a coin. I mean, yeah. And, it's hard to know what the causal element is here, but there's a big chunk of the electorate that really has seen the last few months as an existential crisis to American lives and to American governance and to American economy. And they blame Trump for that. And then there's an equal, an opposite force that you, you talked about his leadership earlier. I think they see it as leadership. I've talked to people who have expressed his, it, tried to convince me of his great leadership in this time because he kept his cool, didn't freak out, he didn't overplay the pandemic, um, and it could have been much worse. And I've heard that again and again. So just to bring that, you know, sort of onto the table, how again do you govern on these issues that do seem to require some basic consensus on facts? 
Yeah. How do you move it forward? Well, as David Ropeek said earlier today on the show that we did early on my on my webcast, um, people don't actually decide. The electorate doesn't decide based on facts. It decides based on feelings and on affiliations and culture. Mm -hmm. So that means, and this has come up repeatedly in <laughs> many discussions, that uh, progressives or liberals like to pummel you with facts to get you to change your mind. Um, whereas and I've heard these good stories about, this is, relates to the ground game of the Republicans, that they have rod and gun clubs and they, they play bowling alleys and mm -hmm. they have a community in churches and they, they are very, they, they're more about relationships than, than facts. And as David Ropeek said, you know, that that's why Trump's pull during a crisis is, is made more profound by the very things that might make a progressive more fearful and cause them mm -hmm. to do their, send their ballot through the mail, um, makes the, the other, the, uh, conservatives or people in this Trumpian mindset, um, more attached to him than ever, even as things get hotter and tougher and Wisconsin has its, you know, COVID melt meltdown. Mm -hmm. And I guess that means for a Biden, the more you're aware of that, the more you, you, you still can find ways to, to sift for common elements. You know, like to build a, like to build a jobs and, and stimulus program that makes the country more resilient. You know, you know, and this is again his his proposal actually includes environmental resilience, not just um, uh, COVID nineteen. Um, mm -hmm. Think of the Midwest flooding; uh, the, it's become fairly chronic part of winter that late winter landscape, uh, mm -hmm. devastating farms. Um, <clears throat> you know, everyone in this country, mm -hmm. I know of no one in a liberal or conservative household who wants to be brittle, who wants to be vulnerable, <laughs> and that that means you know with the right framing, the right approach, you can. Um, you should be able to create a resilience package for um, America that could conceivably get some buy-in. There was that one famous example of the uh, the bigger waters bill, a, ver a very divisive moment in, in the Obama presidency when Congress was yeah. completely against him. The, a bill was passed and signed that essentially was gonna yeah. raise the cost of flood insurance, uh, federal, federally subsidized flood insurance. And, and that I, I still was thinking, God, I got to do a story about how did that happen? You know, like amid all that polarization. And then, of course, as you know, the punchline is when the cost of the insurance started to rise, Republican and yeah. Democrat constituents said, what the hell? <laughs> and they yeah. uh, and they rolled it back. They took it back. Now, now that but there's still a big lesson there. It's like you can do this and maybe there's a way to learn a lesson there and iterate a little bit better how to feather in the costs so there isn't that that jolt that happened. Y you know, and I'm hoping that the, even the coronavirus, you know, one would hope we learn lessons here from uh, how things have played out. You've got a variegated landscape across the country of different, you know, outcomes under the common threat of this virus. And that that's a great landscape to look for lessons learned, both negative and positive. The bringing up the bigger water spill, it also comes back to something you were talking about earlier, the Sometimes in these moments, if you're looking closely enough, you find odd ideological confluences, and those are super valuable. And like in that, I wrote a piece about that Bickert Waters bill with Howard Conrother, who's at, at oh, yeah, Morton sure. Center, and and uh, it was great to work with Howard. And and uh, but I remember I it was the only time I could recall that the Club for Growth and the Sierra Club were on the same. I mean, they were giving the same press releases, basically. Um, and it was pretty extraordinary line. It didn't last long, yeah. um, but it but it was an important gathering moment. And I, I've wondered too, if, if there isn't some way to reframe what we've just been through with Trump out of the equation, you know, with his presence out of it somehow. Yeah. Well, if what, yeah. Conservatives will see this moment in a slightly different light and that maybe there's space there to to rejoin conversation around sort of like basic healthcare, you know, uh, what does a, a society like ours need to have in its hospitals? Basic healthcare kinds of things, right? Um, Although seems it, like a basis, and, and you know, it does involve 
some acknowledgement on the side of progressives, liberals, that many of the things that I and my progressive friends assume are a given, like the cost of carbon, or that our hospitals need more ICU beds, are not a given. There are values judgments in all of these things. The, the price of carbon, the social cost of carbon, I've written about this quite a bit, is a function of values as much as science. It's, there's no number. There's no number that you objectively come up with for how many ton, how, how many dollars a ton avoided now is worth. Um, uh, because a lot of that calculation is based on how much you value the life of a uh, family in Bangladesh on the mm -hmm. coastline. Mm -hmm. And and you can have all these discussions about how much of our domestic cost of carbon should be a function of uh, what happens in other countries. So, th so that's like, and, and I remember early in the pandemic, I, I saw a calculation of, I, I look, there were how many, what's the, the number of hospital beds per thousand people in different countries around the world. And right. Japan, it's right. about 11. And here it's three or 2.8 or something like that. This was in, in yeah. March. Yeah, very low. And so what's the right number? Well, I mean, to some extent that depends on the age of your population. You know, sure. it's still kind of it's mechanistic, but some of it is not mechanistic. It's It relates to how much you value um, prevention, et cetera. And so that yeah. that requires a little bit of a more of an open discussion of those things in the context of COVID policy or, or the like. You know, it's interesting too that um, that you were just touching on the kind of lessons learned possibilities in this time. This is something that's been on my mind a lot. I wrote a piece with Glenn Corbett about it that you helped um, also help find a, a venue for that. And thanks again for that. Um, we'll put it in issues in science and technology, but we're not very good at that in the United States. We, we historically have been good at creating sort of we know the Kimity Commission, maybe, or 9-11 Commission, sort of one-off commissions, particularly when there's some political juice in it, when there's one or two politicians who have either just finished their careers and they're ready for their um, sort of coronation at the end of the career, or when there's some rising young gun who wants to try to make a name. And I don't think that's satisfactory, but I don't know exactly um, how it can be built in this government again because it's we're so polarized we've become facts averse but we clearly need it i mean we need something that's the equivalent of a uh, chemical safety board at the minimum or national transportation yeah. safety board but i'd like to see something much much more robust than that i you know i don't know what your thoughts are on possibility for building something like that but i feel like we've got to have it well we sure do um and you and I, we talked about a little bit of this, but the things that we don't have anymore have some of these characteristics. The Office of Technology Assessment was there for Congress back in the day, too, right. which is not exactly what we're talking about, but at least it was an independent uh, service at the ready for Congress to talk to and say, what, what do we do about this CRISPR, you know, this emerging genetic technology mm -hmm. uh, with all kinds of implications? The National Academy is theoretically does some of this, too. But they're, they're very constrained by the questions they are asked. Uh, famously, George W. Bush asked them to identify the uncertainties in climate science when he first came into office. Mm. And they were very happy to identify the uncertainties. <laughs> so, yeah. In other words, yeah. the questions can constrain what they do. <laughs> yeah. um, but yes, we need, ideally, and it should be, it's a risk analysis, a review if we don't have a methodical way to look at epic jolts to our systems, like what we're experiencing now, or the Midwestern floods that, that have been epic, and or the, the reality that science has identified, we may very well be in the Southwest uh, entering a, me a mega drought. Not, and not necessarily fully a function of climate change, global warming, but you know this is an area that historically has been dry. What do you do? You know, and and then, but certainly on the after effect part, to to interrogate what went wrong, to be very objective, to come in with independence and and look at, um, you know, you know what went right, what went wrong. Well, what is the right number of hospital beds for, for a thousand people for America? Mm -hmm. um, that would be a very valuable thing. And I, I did my first job at the New York Times. I started in 1995. The first week 
I started was the Oklahoma City bombing. So I was, the first week right? of the New York Times is supposed to be this like, oh, da -da, you know, here I am the first week, you know, you get to sit in on the front page meeting and you get to yeah, go to the yeah. art department. <laughs> it's, it's like the stations of the cross, you know? Mm -hmm. So the Wednesday of my first week was the Oklahoma City bombing. And and uh, Gene Roberts, one of the editors, I saw him racing across the news floor going, those bastards. <laughs> And he didn't know who the bastards were yet. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, but the second story was uh, the down the um, destruction of Flight 800, July of 1996, and I spent several months on that story. I was not an av aviation reporter, but that that really, you know, I'd been looking at climate and other systemic environmental issues, and so that I was put on the team for that, and it became this fascinating learning experience of the NTSB. And how they, the National Transportation Safety Board, how they uh, address a question like that, and, and the dynamics around it. How the FBI was eager for it to be a bomb, because that made it their pro, their their investigation, and mm -hmm. and the NTSB had to kind of basically let the facts play out. And without that independent review, you know, these things will always end up being kind of politicized and finger wagging. And so having the capacity for um, a government institution to take on the task with expertise of assessing events of these these kinds feels beyond logical, it feels like an imperative. How worried are you that the, and we touched on this earlier today, that the disinformation, uh, you know, the various you know, conspiracy leanings, we seem to be in one of those hot moments. It's not the first time in American history, but we are right in the thick of a, of a conspiratorial Oh my God. virus to go along with our COVID. Um, how oh. that has to also is just be treated realistically, I think right now. I mean, as a person who's thought, of, I mean, you know about climate denial and all of the different aspects related to it, both as political strategy, but also as personal belief and conspiracy. Yeah. How do you draw on that to move us out of this time? Well, this makes me feel the infodemic as it has become known, at least around the the WHO early on was describing that, is a profound uh, challenge of our moment. This gets back to our four dimensional chess, you know, uh, you're not just playing on a board of four dimensions of risk and response and interlaced politics, but you have active measures being taken to mess it up, <laughs> you know, whether it's Russian hackers or internal uh, you know, QAnon is now in the Congress as Absolutely. You know, the incoming Congress, um, and and the the platforms we all rely on, except for ones like this that are direct, you know, or where there's no one filtering what we're doing, or uh, uh, are ha are basically monetized this engines for money, not for actual progress. We're in we're in a state of I would call it a crisis an information crisis. Uh, and I've been recently, I had a session recently about, um, this is focused on climate, a, a new report on how to do more research, R&D. What, what do we need to actually do basic science on still to make the climate problem, to, to advance new energy technology? Mm -hmm. And it's estimated to be about a tripling of our somnolent energy innovation budget. I first wrote about this in 2006, so I'm a big fan of that. But I was talking to social scientists, uh, a guy named Indra Overland um, in uh, Norway, I believe, or Denmark, I can't remember. He, on Twitter, I found him and he um, he had recently done a paper saying of our the world's overall budget for science, that social science on climate is 0.12% of research budgets. It, and it's a tiny fraction even of climate science. So climate science is mostly studying hurricanes and locking satellites. And, and this little fraction of an inch of that is studying how people do or don't respond to climate change. Right. And, you know, what do you right. do? And, and uh, Laurie Garrett, uh, the, the great Pulitzer winning journalist of plague of our plague era, who was on your show recently, um, she did a piece in the Lancet early this year on the uh, underinvestment and communication divisions of like the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. That, which is already starved for money and capacity with or without us pulling out. And, and this tiny, tiny, tiny budget is for like actually monitoring social media in, in an age of an epidemic around a pandemic. And that's like 
that means we have not remotely recognized the need to better understand the communication landscape around these issues that, that people like David Ropeek and, and you and others, we know very well the failures and challenges in this arena, and we're just not engaged. And I'm not saying that studying something always leads to, you know, an aha moment and a solution, yeah, yeah. but it's sure if it, I feel like I'm back with the information pollution, mm -hmm. where I was in writing about climate research, uh, energy innovation in 2006, that where, you know, we've been in a decades long bipartisan slumber party on the need to boost energy innovation. And I think this is even an order of magnitude worse, the gap in understanding of how we don't understand risk mm -hmm. and what to do about it. With that in mind, we're almost up on time, but I, you know, just talking about this, I don't want to lose my social science credentials when I say this, <laughs> but there have been lots of moments where I come back to where we started this conversation, which is I, maybe we just need a Greta, we need a couple of artists, we need people who don't play by any of these rules. They don't play by the party rules. They don't play by the peer reviewed rules. They're not confined by those. And they build a movement which can formulate change in ways that are hard to predict and hard to quantify. Now, I caution my caution to myself and others when I say that is that we've just, we've, we've had that for the last four years in the United States and his name has been Donald Trump. You can't always predict. Yeah how the iconoclast and the person who cuts through the rules and the norms, you can't predict the outcome of that. And it's been negative in this regard, certainly around the pandemic and around climate, but it does work. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> the challenge going forward, well, there's several challenges. One certainly is that it's easier to be a, um, an iconoclast breaker of norms in pursuit of stasis, which is mm. Trump, mm -hmm. than in pursuit of change. Mm. That everyone assumes that this is somehow a uniform landscape. Uh, I remember I used to give a talk in which I described uh, the climate problem. It's like a boulder uh, on, a, on a slope stuck in a path. And and the uh, those who are seeking stasis, wh whose job is to maintain the status quo, can be standing there with a feather duster, just kind of like mm -hmm. dusting the boulder. And there's Al Gore and everybody trying to push the boulder over, up the hill mm -hmm. and then over the top. And because uh, this came up so often, well, they have so much money they're spending on propaganda or whatever. Yeah, they're spending money on propaganda to maintain the status quo, which is what we all want to do anyway, right? That's mm -hmm. the re, the re, re part of us. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's just a fundamentally different task to take on that boulder and with so much strength that you you push it up that hill and over the transition point to uh, so it's rolling in a new direction. And that's... Uh, that's why it's different. That's why it's easier for Trump to have popped up and commanded the attention, uh, not only of his minions, but of us too, for four, four, well, six years, you know, however long it's been. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your time, Andy. I just want to give a second here at the end um, to plug your webcast, Sustain What, and maybe hear from you what's coming up on that. I mean, somebody was writing on twitter earlier like everybody who's had a podcast and was saying things before the election we're not interested in all that anymore we want to know you know it, maybe it's a breaking point elections are always like that a little bit what's coming up for you well every sunday is music and, and the arts uh, this sunday some musical climate scientists are coming on uh, ray ray pierre humbert who's uh the halley professor of physics at oxford He's a really good accordion player. And player, he'll be on again awesome. with with Richard Alley from Penn State, uh, Greenland uh, uh, pioneering scientist who got the age of the uh, climate change cores out of the Greenland ice sheet. His daughter, uh, Karen Karen Alley, I think it's Karen, is one of the world, one of the country's best uh, hammer dulcimer players. So she'll be on. And Monday, I, I don't know, I can't I can't think that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> 
a lot of sessions coming up on the Mondays are all on skills. How do we, mm -hmm. how, how do you avoid being harassed uh, on the internet? You know, how do you uh, find a place to publish if you want to be uh, writing on the internet? How do you uh, do incorporate better graphics? So Mondays, the thriving online sessions are mostly about skills. Wednesdays are policy. Fridays are the media. And on we go. And we find you on Twitter using the hashtag sustain what? Sustain what? Yeah, in my name. If people just Google for Revkin and the thing they're wondering about, like Revkin flood, <laughs> Revkin <laughs> TWA 800, Revkin climate, you'll find more than you ever wanted to know. I guess that's you were showing that Discover uh, magazine a little earlier, and uh, it is quite something. The the many different vantage points you've had on these different on these topics. Yeah. I mean, it must be incredibly gratifying now to be able to do these conversations. And people say, yes, they want to talk. They want you to facilitate those conversations. I mean, that must be fun, right? Well, you know, I, I think to me, it's partially helps me stay sane. It helps me keep focused on the reality that all paths forward are in, iterative mm -hmm. uh, and that better ideas emerge through conversation. Ideally, tough conversation too, not just, hey, we're all friend, buddy, buddy. And that that's one of my frontiers is to build out the landscape of people who come on to to get some more libertarian and mm -hmm. conservative voices uh, who are who are constructive. Um, so there's always like a a, a, a directionality uh, to me. I, I, like it's like journalism used to be a sort of a simple thing. I look at stuff, I take notes, and I tell you your own story back to you. Mm -hmm. You you being America, or whatever. And journalism now, the journalism that fits this century is more like uh, being a, a mountain guide after an avalanche where no one knows the landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, someone has general skills and like directionality uh, mm -hmm. is generally honest, is generally looking for the best path and uh, and then try, you know follow that person. That, that feels mm -hmm. like a better approach to um, for journalism going forward too and for inquiry generally. Well, I'll be following your your lead and trying to learn from you to get those kind of conversations going too. And maybe again after this election, um, there'll be new opportunities for conversation. Yeah, and I'd like. Well, I think we both would. Uh, I'd love to amplify what you're doing. I, I'm trying to find support to make sure this thing works, you know, <laughs> is sustainable in some way or other. So that's another one of my challenges. And the other thing, though, is um, I think we both learned lessons that hopefully people can understand. Just get going. Just get started. I mean, I just found StreamYard because Sri Srinivasan was using it for his Sunday mm -hmm. uh, New York Times read-alongs, and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And and it goes to four different places. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. maybe I'll add these little things, or I'll use it differently. It's like my songwriting friends, who are more frequent songwriters than I am. Uh, Claudia Gibson on my show said, "You have to be you have to be enthusiastic about writing a bad song in order to write a good one." So it's like, just write, just get going. And uh, that's, that's I think, a lesson for, hopefully, for a wider cohort of people. Andy Revkin, thanks for making time on this day after the election when we still don't know who's won. But um, I had to you know, look down the list of folks that I wanted to get perspective from today as I begin to think about what could be next. Um, and you're definitely the guy I wanted to talk to. So thanks for your time. And we will keep in touch. Uh, okay. Certainly, everybody, be sure to follow Andy at the Earth Institute and on Twitter at Revkin and also his Sustain What webcast. And check out those Sunday uh, performances because they really are cool. Andy, thanks for coming on COVID Calls. Great to see you. Be well. Okay, everybody, you can catch us every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time and stay healthy. We'll see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock.